Okay, get myself back in order. Next item is uh, Megan coming up with an update on water reforms. So, uh, welcome, Megan. Kia ora, Mr. Chair, our committee. You'll be glad to know I don't have a presentation, just a quick verbal intro and then happy to take questions. <clears throat> so the purpose of this report uh, is really just asking for um, a delegated group to provide uh, some important uh, and quite quick feedback, ultimately to Cabinet uh, over the next month, uh, on the Charter or the Interim Economic Regulation for Water Care as part of the Auckland Solution to Local Water Done Well. Since May, which is when the Mayor and the Minister made the announcement, uh, staff have been working with the Department of Internal Affairs and the Commerce Commission, who has been announced as the Interim Regulator and the Crown Monitor for Water Care, um, basically on two areas. One, on some standards of interim e uh, economic regulation, financial standards, reporting standards, some organisational standards. Uh, and also the second element is the price path. Um, for the various tariffs um, <clears throat> uh, for developers, residents, businesses, you know, users for water. So the LTP, uh, the Auckland Council LTP is the base, um, but obviously we know that in, the, in time, in the full economic regulation, the Commerce Commission will have a very strong role in setting prices. And you'll also know, um, and in response and implementation of the, of the governing body resolutions, um, that they will try and get the uh, lowest cost um, to consumers, and so that's really the purpose of setting out this charter, certainly for about two or three years, the first two or three years um, of, uh, the, of the new reform, which will start in 1 July 2025. So all of this direction um, kind of implements the governing body um, resolutions around this, uh, and so you'll see in the recommendations um, I've asked for a small group, being the Mayor, the Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Baker as Chair of this committee, Councillor Turner as the Water Care Liaison uh, Councillor, and a member of Hokura, Independent Māori Statutory Board, to work with me uh, and a couple of others just to review those settings uh, for a Cabinet decision ultimately before Christmas. What this will do was enable Water Care to kind of complete its business plan and ultimately get a credit rating uh, in the kind of February, March, April time. So uh, it's quite condensed timeframes, um, but it's all looking positive and, as I said, implementing the resolutions here of the governing body and the legislation that the Minister has passed. I might leave it at that, Mr Chair, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Megan. Um, questions? Brilliant. Um, no, too late. Desley's already indicated, but Chris, um, oh, why, uh, John, you got a question? Not a question, no. Oh, okay. Comment? Yeah, yeah, no, just, I was just... Through, um, through the Commerce Commission. Just move a very slight amendment uh, to A to, to, uh, to include uh, um, Councillor Fletcher in that group too as the Deputy Chair of this committee, which is um, usually the, the custom and practice, and I, I'm, I'm assuming... Councillor Fletcher would be interested in that. Yeah, so I'll just move that uh, that addition to A. Perfectly reasonable. Um, any other any other questions, comments? Okay, Desley, you happy to move? And Chris, happy to second. Thank you. All uh, any other comments? None. Those in favour, say aye. aye. And against, carried. All right, next um, up is the AT quarterly report, and I think Dave, oh, here he comes, is uh, going to be presenting this. Welcome. Thank you. Kia ora um, yes, hello. Um, I'm Dev Jags. I'm with the Strategic Programs Office. Um, we're here supporting the CCO partnership team at the moment while they're quite busy. So here to present the quarter one report uh, for AT. I'm going to leave things in the building as well. Um, we'll take questions after this. Uh, so this covers the uh, period from 1st July to 30th September, um, covering the highlights and key concerns from the report. 
Um, and this is the first report reflecting the updated measures and deliverables uh, from the current SOI. So overall, AT are currently meeting or exceeding uh, 15 of their 23 performance measures. Uh, three are yet to be uh, reported, sorry, and four currently not meeting expectations. Uh, the first one, AT listens and responds, um, remains a priority for AT, uh, and it's still not quite met. Uh, it's at 31%, just below the target of 33%. However, this has seen a 9% increase from the last quarter. Uh, the other measures not currently met are public boardings, uh, although noting that this is 9% above the previous year. Uh, the Fairbox recovery ratio, uh, which the report highlights, is impacted by poor weather and rail issues. The percentage of budget invested, uh, and that's largely been impacted by the uncertainty uh, around the NLTP. And percentage of procurements with multi owned businesses, which is currently at 2.91%, slightly below the target of 3%. Um, and AT are anticipating uh, increased spend through large projects coming up. Measures we don't currently have the figures for are uh, local board satisfaction. That's now moved to uh, half yearly reporting, so that will be in the subsequent report. Emissions reduction, as we're waiting data uh, from later this month. And percentage of capital program delivery on time, as they're still working on an appropriate measure for this one. In terms of their deliverables, they've seen 34 out of 38 currently on track. The four currently at risk. Uh, of delivering less than expected outcomes, uh, largely due to the impacts of the NLTP funding. In terms of finance, AT's year-to-date surplus from operations, excluding depreciation of 22 million, is 20 million favorable to budget, and that favorable variance is largely driven by low operational costs in the quarter. Just pulling out some highlights from the report, the first is that there was no serious injuries or deaths on Auckland Roads in July, the first time this has happened Yes, since April 2020. So definitely something to be celebrated. Um, it also saw the introduction of the $50 uh, weekly fair cap, and we've already seen 20,000 Aucklanders, uh, probably more now, um, benefiting from this initiative. We've also seen the accelerated ferry program nearing completion, and Gulf Harbour has since resumed full schedule. And the main highway dynamic tr timing project, uh, pilot in Ellerslie, is now live. In terms of risks, uh, the NLTP, as you'll be aware, has not been approved and confirms the lower levels of funding. And the governing body has since, obviously, agreed to the full local share of 2.2 billion for transport as confirmed in the LTP. Um, so AT will be modifying their SOI to reflect the changes and we'll be reporting on this in the next report. Safety has obviously been another focus um, and area of concern for AT during this quarter, uh, highlighted by some uh, serious um, incidents um, recently. Uh, in response to that, AT is currently assessing quotes for driver screens for the buses, um, aiming to begin installation in early 2025, uh, so targeting January, February. And AT is also continuing to work with key partners, including council and police, to deliver crime prevention initiatives to continue to improve passenger safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. So um, Dean and the team are here to answer any questions. Um, if we can limit our questions to what is in the report. Uh, so are there any uh, questions on this quarterly report? I'm happy to move it. Got a question, Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, we'll just go Chris Darby first and then uh, come back to you, Wayne. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Dean and team. Just. Um, I guess, Dean, it follows up on something I did start to raise at the board, but paragraph 30, um, the percentage of the capital delivery um, completed on time, that, that's about the, the budget. And I guess what I'm interested in, in trying to understand is, is there opportunity within reporting on the capital delivery program to outline the, the delivery of the benefits that were foreseen when planning those projects and well in this case projects those capital projects because you're you're developing that methodology and i think from my point of view i just look at these numbers being met but i don't get a sense that the benefits the expected benefits from the projects are being delivered uh look to, to confirm uh, typically what happens around council tables is um 
percentage invested against budget as a proxy for delivery of the project and therefore the benefits. We know that's not the case. So we'll continue to report on progress against budget, cost versus budget, that'll always happen. Uh, we are developing a methodology to help us understand to what degree have we not only been investing in that capital program or project, but how far through we are and are we on time and scope with it. So you will start to get that reporting, that's what we're working on right now. And then the other side of a project being completed is whether the benefits from that investment are being realised or not. Uh, so the team is putting good work on that. Uh, I am involved at the right level on the thinking. Uh, and we're also looking with the methodology around how we will measure this to achieve a couple of things. One is to ensure that whatever we come up with can be used across the council family and is not inconsistent with the likes of NZTA and others. Uh, and we're also using Transport for New South Wales as a, as a, a challenge of our methodology to ensure that um, it fits with some of that best practice we see in other jurisdictions. Our commitment to come back on that model wasn't until the end of this calendar year. So I, I believe we're largely on track for that, but you'll see this report, if not at the next quarterly business report, early in the new year with where we're at. Our intention is to, to report, and that's, you know, that's a firm commitment. Thank you. Wayne. Yes, uh, sure. Um, I may have missed it, Mr Chair, but have we had that um, uh, complete uh, report and update on... Um, on the ferries, including uh, in particular ferry procurement? Uh, not to this committee. I'm, I'm going to turn around and look at Stacey, uh, Councillor, am I not? La okay, last month. We, did we bring it to this committee last month? And to think I was here. Um, uh, sorry, Councillor. Uh, oh, yeah, now no, that's terrible. <laughs> Hey, uh, so, Councillor, we bought it last month. Um, we'll we'll get you the copy of the presentation. Uh, okay, okay, I missed it. Uh, I'll I'll probably get back to you on that because um, no doubt I've got a few outstanding questions. But um, I'm very pleased that we've had some reporting. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Mike. Mike. Sorry. Um, in regard um, uh, to uh, safety, I, 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 I see there are um, <coughs> no deaths or serious injuries on Auckland Road in July 2024, the first month without a death since April 2020. Without getting into too much detail, there have been deaths on Auckland Road, one in particular, and there has been violence on Auckland Roads, quite often in buses. And um, I see that at last AT um, had been, since 2022, trialling screens for bus driver safety, but I, I understand now um, that you actually are at last moving on that. So w when are the, the bus fleets likely to be fully protected uh, so there's two different measures. Uh, one is for, uh, and I know that they might all happen in the road space, so I'll take that subtlety uh, well, but there is death and serious injury uh, as a result of vehicle movements, and then there is uh, the, the violence, uh, threats and aggression uh, that we saw uh, that does result in death, for example, the fatal stabbing. So we, we, we capture both. Uh, they, they, different sorts of measures. Um, and so, yes, the July result was pleasing, and you can see the benefit of a range of interventions that are bringing down uh, that, that, that death and serious injury toll on our roads. In terms of violence, threats and aggression, we've got a range of initiatives in place. One of them is um, safety screening for drivers. Uh, I am pleased that it's being, it's now funded and being implemented. We've got a rollout program over the next two years. So you'll see those progressively going. But that's not the only thing we're doing because that, that protects the driver in the event of um, a situation. Uh, you'll all be aware that we have uh, customer on customer uh, challenges as well. 
So we have got a range of things that we're working through, including with the police, to look at how we might address uh, the more generic societal issue of violence, threat and aggression. Um, we are not leaving this untouched. We're going hard at it to see to, for to, so that I and we can be satisfied. We're doing everything we can uh, to support a safe environment across public transport. Um, and we have got good support, whether it's from the police, churches, community groups, youth workers, uh, and the like. So uh, we are doubling down on this. Sadly, we're not the only organisation in New Zealand or across the globe where this situation is continuing to increase. Um, but we are very committed. Can, just to follow up, in terms of, of the safety and perception of safety, um, on buses in particular. Um, have, has AT considered putting notices on buses that if you see um, antisocial behaviour or violence or abuse, because not all these cases are reported, some people call me about it, but obviously they're not officially reported, I pass it on of course, but um, that may be only a fraction. Is there some thought to putting um, information on buses that if, if there is antisocial behaviour or worse, call this number or text this number, um, but that may give some assurance to the passengers. If, if belatedly and at last the drivers are going to get protection, there's still the passengers and I think that's much more difficult. Do you want to add anything to that answer, Stacey? In terms of signage on buses around notifying passengers who to call. Um, I'll invite Stacey for the particular on that. Mike, sorry, I don't. In, in terms of how customers report, Council Lee? Yeah. So uh, with, with crime stoppers, we are trying to make it easier as well. So there's more interactive forms, there's different means so people can provide more information as they do that. The thing that we're finding is that trying to get all the information allocated into oh, one spot is quite tricky in terms of that because it comes through so many different sort of methods, whether that be the contact centre, our website, the, the app, um, Crime Stoppers, or just reported at a service centre. So trying to get all that into what I call one data bus base that's robust is, is important, and so we're doing that. The other thing that we've done, actually, which I might bring a screenshot to show you next Transport Resilience and Infrastructure Committee, is actually what we've done with fear evasion in order to be able to understand that better. Because what we've done is be able to make it easier for the bus drivers to report it. So making it easier for them to report it then all goes into uh, what I call Power BI database. We can see exactly the GPS location where that has been reported. And based on size and terms of attribution, we can deploy transport officers to support in those particular areas. So we can drill down to bus level. So what particular bus routes and what times of day and things like that that's been recorded. And so getting that consistency is giving us a lot more information in order to be able to proactively deploy where these things are happening. It's not a, it's not, doesn't necessarily mean that's where these things are happening, but often it's a precursor to other things. And so dealing with that too. And, and just a, a final note, that's an area where we're using that, um, I don't want to say artificial, inquired intelligence across what's happening across our networks. Uh, we're working closely with the police to combine yeah. our knowledge of what's happening with their knowledge of what's happening. So when we do deploy, mm -hmm. we employ, uh, deploy purposefully our transport officers, their police, um, uh, to look to intervene or moderate um, some of the poor behaviour we're seeing. Mm. I'd just, I just make a plea really to that people on buses need real time, um, a, the real time ability to communicate if, if there is trouble and I uh, ask you to give it earnest consideration how a system could be set up to give that surety to people because I think this problem is not going to get any better um, uh, and I think AT and Auckland Council really needs to think seriously about this. So thank you. Thank you yeah, yeah, so we'll, sorry Richard. I was just going to say, look, um, we will look at that, but I don't, if, if the public are listening to this or, 
or, or, or you are in a situation, the first number to call when it is serious is 111. Yeah. And we don't want to confuse people with any other message. If, if, there is a, if there is a situation that does need to report it, it doesn't require 111, then of course Look, if, we if want you, to draw if that If you're into... abusing someone for being an Asian, you, yep. you're not going to call 111. You've so, got to have something different. Do you I, understand? It's real-time length and, and backup for people who are passengers and feeling vulnerable. I think I acknowledge that. Correct. What okay. about 4030? Thank you. Um, Richard. Uh, thanks, Jet. Just a couple of quick questions. One on the asset conditions. I don't believe I've seen a number that looks so low for public transport before, 63%. What, what is, what's that about the asset condition? It seems very low. What did you ask? Um, it's the asset just... conditions, asset class, public transport, yep. very good, good, moderate. Yep. So Murray Burt's going to come and provide... Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I want to get to that, but um, that's about asset condition. But Murray's going to talk about your question. Yeah, thank you. Th thanks for the question, and I was uh, expecting it. So um, the reason why the public transport um, asset condition is quite low at the moment is to do with wharf repairs. And uh, there's, I guess, seasonal work that can happen, so a lot of work will be happening on the wharves over summer, so we expect that to change. Uh, and it's the components of the wharf that are... Um, degrading uh, over the winter period. Okay, that makes um, sense. On PT, looks like bus, you know, bus and ferry are still hitting pretty good. But and I know I email you all the time, Stacey. Rail. I mean, are, how closely are we discussing with Kiwi Rail those random issues that keep popping up? So I think people understand the upgrades that need to happen, but you know, three days of power failures closing whole lines at, during peak. Um, random closures, signal failures. It, it is, you know, we are less than half on trains now what we were pre-COVID, and it's not going to improve if this doesn't improve. Absolutely. So we are going through every single incident that's, you know, reported or impacts in terms of our punctuality and reliability of services. Those issues with power had to do with the, the single line running works that were happening uh, through that corridor and the power feed in order to be able to sustain peak level um, operations. Uh, so there was definitely some learnings there. So we make sure that those things are turned upside down so so that they are understood and learned from so they're not repetitive. Yeah. And last question, um, Chair. On the safety, I see it's like uh, 1,800 roads or corridors are going to need their speeds reversed under the new rule. I mean, when you've got zero deaths and serious injuries on, in July and you have the first time in 10 years, Labour Weekend, no this on the road. I mean, how, who was responsible for this? We, we are going, is it us, is it the AT board? Who is going to be responsible for the deaths and serious injuries that do come back if we, you know, I know it's not the only case, <clears throat> speed is not the only factor, but clearly it must be having an evidential impact. Um. Our, our obligation is to comply with the law. The law requires us to change the speed limits. And, and it's, it's, um, it's as simple and as complex as that all at the same time, yeah. Councillor. So that is what we will give effect to. And yes, there is a cost and there's a time to do that, and we will do that. But at the same time, we will work with communities uh, because we remain committed to reducing death and serious injuries on the roads uh, as to what might need to happen, uh, and it could be um, it could be signage, it could be um, a raised pedestrian crossing, or it might be uh, a signalised intersection, whatever it is, to help continue this direction of safe system thinking and design for our transport system. Uh, so our job is to comply with the law, specifically on the eighteen hundred roads that need to change. And. In the letter, the update from the minister when it came out and the update from NZTA, there was this one part of the document that I'm hoping can reduce that 1800. It says, if there is a local street where a permanent 30K has been applied, but the reason for setting the 30K wasn't because there was a school in the area, then the speed limit does not need to be reversed. Are we complying with that? Because that came out on the minister's announcement, which would mean town centres and a whole lot of others do not have to have their speeds reversed. 
Yeah. So, look, the team, the transport safety team are going through um, both what the legislative requirements are and the guidance uh, and working up a program of how we will change that, but also where we have communities or where we have situations like the one you've just outlined that seek a speed reduction or there's one in place that complies, that they're, they're going through and doing all of that triage. What I suggest is rather than me trying to dive into the detail of it now, the best thing would be for us to come back maybe in December and give you a briefing on where we're at with managing the change process and what that looks like. And that includes you know, variable signage outside all of the schools and how we're looking to manage that and work with those communities. Okay, thank you. Julie? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the bus uh, safety issue. So um, I talked to um, someone from one of the bus unions last week and uh, just wanted to confirm my understanding is that there's a trial of the screens that's been happening um, through Richie's out of their Takaanini depot. Is that, do you guys know about that? Absolutely. So they are installing 50 screens on particular routes that we uh, organised with them earlier this year. So they are currently being sort of rolled out at the moment. And I just wanted to clarify too, one of the reasons for trialling it is that there are actually quite a lot of concerns from drivers that they might feel like they were sort of caged in or separated from customers, which is something they didn't want. And the design, the feedback coming through the design so far is actually that the drivers are feeling pretty good about this design. Is that what you're hearing as well? Correct. And that sort of correlates to the trial that we did with Kinetic last year as well. And we adapted some of the design in order to, with the feedback from the drivers to make sure that, you know, the glare and those types of things that impact their, their workspace were taken care of with the designs. Great. And are you aware also that there's a significant report coming through from um, the union about the broader issues about things like racism on the buses and stuff like that that should be out in the next week or two? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Wayne, oh, sorry, Josephine, and then Wayne. Oh, cool. Now, I heard that the bus shelters were, you know, the bus, what do you call it? The thing that keeps the bus drivers safe. Projection. Projection screens were rolled out out South Auckland, but I was just wondering, is there any chance of it coming out to, you know, the 7.0 and the 7.4 where we've had the issues? Good question, Councillor. Yes, I mean, it would be progressive. So, I mean, the aim is to have 80% done within the next two years. So, it, it's quite a challenge in terms of there's so many various different types of fleet across the network. So, it's getting that standardisation by, by fleet type uh, and then doing sort of bulk manufacturing and getting them installed across the network. So, that, that'll be progressive, but over the next two two years, 80% is the target in terms of that. So the older buses in the fleet obviously won't be prioritising because it is a considerable cost to be able to do it and retrofit them, uh, but that's the goal. Um, also, was there any um, police report or learnings between police and AT about the stabbing on the Unhunga bus? At this stage, it's still very much with the police and their investigation. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then also, um, right now, I'm dealing with a lot of... Um, businesses and Glendinus who are suffering because of the roadworks that we've had going over there a year now. Um, is there any way Auckland Transport can work on some kind of relief package to bring to us for, I don't know, LTP or annual plan um, in terms of rates relief? Because that was one of the things that the businesses asked for. I, I think I'd want to refer that back to Barry and the council team because... Um, uh, a, a rates relief package is essentially uh, something that would need to be fully supported by council and the finance team, and it would touch on pretty much everything that Water Care, Healthy Waters, and others do. So, uh, look, we're happy to contribute what we think that impact looks like and how we might best manage it. But my understanding, of current council policy doesn't provide for it. We will, of course, though. Can I just say, notwithstanding the rates relief. We are looking at continuously improving how we work with those businesses to promote them locally while we're there, uh, minimise the impact. Um, we're a lot more focused on getting work uh, in town centres and on main roads in particular out of those busy periods and doing them off peak or overnight. So there's a, whole, there's a long way to go on this because there's a lot of embedded assumption and practice, but we're looking constantly at how we can relieve the impact on local residents and businesses. 
in a non-financial sense. Okay, thank you. And also, um, just a word of thanks for your support, um, Stacey, with the stabbing on the Onehunga bus, bus and how fast you were in responding with information that I could use to reassure uh, my communities um, that everything was being done that could be done to keep people safe when they catch the bus on the train. So really appreciated that. Um, and then also with like the person that was run down on Point England Road, um, so appreciating um, Auckland Transport support to try and address safety in, in Point England. And in Glen Innes train station, where we've had teenagers being attacked, getting off the train there. So it's just um, crazy that, you know, um, all this violence and aggression is happening in society, but also on our transport networks. Just crazy. So I really appreciate your um, response. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we come back to you, Wayne, for your second dig, will um, Lotu has got a question? Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, team, for your um, report. Just a question on um, in uh, paragraph 29, you list some of the things where the measures were not met, um, and you did mention slightly under was your Māori-owned uh, business target of 3%. If you just wanted to talk a bit about that. And then also, um, I'm interested whether you have something similar, a target for Pacifica businesses, for example. Kia ora. Uh, look, the, the, of course we want all our targets to meet or exceed, and we're disappointed. Um, 2.91 versus 3 sounds very close, um, and we're very committed to it meeting or exceeding that target. Uh, which we will ensure happens. Okay, that's uh, working with Maori businesses. We have no target um, that has been, been agreed with council around Pacifica businesses. Kia ora. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lotu. Wayne. It's hi. Um, just got a, a question further to um, the issue that Mike Lee raised around um, safety on buses and, um, and trains. Um, I've, I've been on um, some public uh, transport overseas recently, uh, particularly um, the London uh, Metro, and there's a, a very regular uh, message that um, goes up that advises people about a, you know, contact point and, and the like for reporting um, a range of things. I think it's quite effective, um, and... On buses, there's messaging um, as well. Obviously, they've got slightly different um, issues to us. But uh, my question is, do we keep abreast of what um, other cities overseas are doing around issues like this that are um, effective? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. And... Do we have any um, recorded messages on our um, on our trains that um, that cover off um, uh, safety and related issues? Yes, we do. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Um, honey, um, just a follow-on question from um, Councillor Lee regarding um, Māori outcome achievement, just under three percent. I'm aware that there's an encouragement to go into 5%. Um, <laughs> I'm just wanting to understand if, what, what type of opportunities to actually get to the 5 that could be um, placed up. Uh, look, I, I haven't thought that one through, uh, to be fair. Uh, so I would welcome the opportunity to do that. Our, our commitment at this stage under the Statement of Intent is to, to achieve three, and that's what I've given a commitment to deliver on. What it might look like to achieve five, I think that's a discussion that we would need to have. Um, and tell me what would that look like, but also uh, is that an expectation of Council of Auckland Transport as well? Uh, in, in saying that, then it's good that you're actually going to be following through uh, directly with uh, that mana whenua procurement space. Because it's um, good to see it in the plan, but in some realities, that's how that comes about to achieve it. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Um, is there any debate on this? We're just receiving it.
I anticipate not. Um, someone, Desley, I think, would like to move. You can't second it then. No, no, no. I just wanted to talk to one other thing, if I can, Chair. You may. One minute. We do leave, we lose people at four o'clock and we'll lose the quorum at four o'clock, so uh, we've got a little bit of time, but crack in. Right. Uh, so, look, just uh, many of you all know we went out with what we call the Pothole Promise. This was our commitment to dealing with potholes in the, the road corridor. Uh, our commitment was 95% of all potholes reported would be remediated uh, where they are on a main road uh, within 24 hours. Outside of that, on a local road, it would be within five days. 97% of all potholes reported, 384 in the first week, were uh, achieved the deadline. So um, I'm really pleased with the way the organisation has responded. I'm really pleased that people have felt free to report those potholes and that we're achieving our target. Uh, many, uh, many skeptics would have said, uh, wasn't a snowflake's hope? Well, we've just proven everybody wrong in the first week or 10 days. Um, and I'm really pleased with where we've got to. Other than that, um, I'm also very pleased with where the organisation's at the first quarter. It's um, four quarters in one game. We've hit the first quarter. Uh, I can see the gaps uh, that we need to focus on. Uh, we've identified four measures where we're not meeting. Um, and I believe we've got the organisational response and capacity to do so. So, look, I'm very pleased with where we're at, and I thank you for your support. And I truly appreciate the 97% result. Thank you. And so uh, let's um, got Ken all good interested so you've got a question Ken? With all due respect I just want to know how long they're going to stay filled for like um, filling them is one target the length of the longevity of the repair is the other target. Uh, of, of course I agree and we're focused on both. And, and can I say I did spend a little bit of time out there they're using Murray probably do a bit of the me but they are using new technology. They're bringing in basically patches that have been used in South Africa. They take a little bit longer to do the pothole, but it removes that risk of the crumbling and stuff. And so it's like putting a sticking plaster with chip seal over the top, um, over the top of the pothole. And uh, the Fulton Hogan people who have been doing it that I went out with said that the, the recalls has just stopped. So um, better technology, Ken. You look like you just don't hear. believe. Good to hear. Good heart. Good to hear. Good. Be, be interesting to watch. Thank you. I'm glad you're celebrating with us. Okay, so that's uh, now spurred a whole lot of questions. So um, yeah, we've got Julie, Lotu, and Josephine. Kia ora, thank you. So is the new technology being? Because obviously this is for the arterials. Um, I'm dealing with a couple of neighbourhoods where we've got a lot of development going on and so there's constant potholes. And the, the underlying issue is actually that the, the road will be redone, properly redone, um, once you know, we've not got bus detours and stuff like that anymore. But until then, we have to just keep doing these patches. But are you going to do those fancy South African patches on those local roads or is that only available for arterial ones? South African. Well, didn't he say South African? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm just giving credit where it's due. I think the intent is wherever there's uh, technology advances or new approaches that we apply that across the network. Okay. But um, where, where the underlying road pavement is um, at end of life and it needs rehabilitation, then uh, a patch can only last so long. Yeah, and so there will be times when actually we do have to repatch and repatch until we can do that road pavement repair. Is that accurate? Yeah, thank you. Um, and so... I've just been advised we're going to lose our quorum at three. So unless uh, the questions... No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. They're just leaving at three. They're leaving at three? Yeah. yeah but more people will we're just not leave. Right. Oh. It's fine. I suffer from. Can't count. Um, OK, so, um, no, don't trust me with your money. Lotu. Uh, kia ora, thank you. I just wanted to ask, what's the best way for our communities to contact you about potholes? Because I know in my area they're probably not reporting. Um, is there a pothole hotline or an AI? Uh, there is. It, it's all online. So there's a pothole promise online uh, way to record where it is. So we will circulate that to all of you. Have we got a hotline? <laughs> um, there's a lot of playing words here. I'm trying to avoid all of them. I'm not very good at this stuff because sometimes I say it wrong. 
don't ask Stacey, but having said that, uh, we will circulate it to you and then you can circulate it to others. It's real easy. Awesome. Thank you. Go. Um, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, I have seen some of the social media um, that's out there and I think it's really helpful um, and really good. Uh, the potholes one, I'm happy to share that as well because we've got potholes, but it doesn't cover private roads right in the town centre, just our own public roads. Uh, private roads are exactly that and it's their responsibility. If you've got an issue, then you do need to out it with the town centre manager or the... Oh, uh, well, we have it around where we are in the viaduct. There's plenty of places. Yeah. Uh, report the pothole to them. Oh, yeah. And maybe get another spokesperson besides <laughs> besides that guy <laughs> that I've been seeing fronting your social media. Cut you off, eh? <laughs> If we've got others of you that want to be part of our social media campaign, then uh, we will, of course, receive all offers. Yeah. And we've got some other cool things coming up too, but I wouldn't want to let them out of the bag before um, it's time to do so. But there's a lot of good stuff happening. Cool. I'm only joking. That's right. It's I okay. think I like. I think I threw you a like. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. Okay, so um, we've, uh, we've got to the end of the questions. Um, is there any debate? I don't think there is. So um, I think Desley was going to move this and Chris Darby was, had his hand up before to second it. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. And against carried. Thank you, team. Next is um, Roger and artificial intelligence.